thanks to everyone for joining us today. We're going to be talking about pay to play. And um, my name is Ki Hong. I'm a, 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 the head of the political law group at Skadden Arps and deal with this stuff day to day. Uh, I actually have a couple of our colleagues here as well, Tyler Rosen and Charlie Richardelli. Uh, next to me, uh, we have uh, uh, Keith Marks uh, from, from the uh, Compliance Solution Strategies. Uh, Holly Hunter, uh, CC, from the SEC, and if you ever want to go see a waiver, you call Holly, uh, and uh, Garrett brought up from the AMG. Um, and uh, just a couple of initial notes. We have a lot of stuff we're going to be going over today. Uh, we probably will not reach the end of it, so we're going to, you'll see a couple of sections toward the end, like gifts and, and lobbying, which uh, we may not get to, but uh, you know the uh, slides are pretty detailed, so you, it'll be a good reference for all of you. Uh, the other thing is we're, we will be saving questions up for uh, the end because, again, we have so much uh, to do here. Uh, pay to play, you know, the, 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 today, actually, I know it, the title is pay to play, but we really are talking about the laws and regulations you need to think about whenever you're dealing with the government, whether it be public pension funds or deferred comp plans. Um, it's gotten to a point in our society now that everything you do with public officials are now regulated in one way or another. Uh, if you are working with them or dealing with them on election-related activities, you have pay-to-play laws and campaign finance laws to consider. If you're trying to get business from them, you have the lobbying laws uh, to deal with. Uh, and if you're dealing with them personally, and heaven forbid you're dating one of these people, you have the gift laws to consider. Uh, believe it or not, here in the, the U, uh, U.S. Capitol, if you want to date a senator, you actually have to get approval to pay, the sen uh, to pay for the senator's lunch. And uh, actually have represented some lobbies in doing that. And, uh, and, and don't ask me what kind of evidence you have to produce uh, to, to show that, but it's gotten to that level of scrutiny and that level of... Uh, the craziness. So we'll be talking about uh, some uh, big areas in this space. We're going to be talking about linkage and quid pro quo, uh, charitable contributions, uh, campaign contributions, and obviously as part of that it will be pay to play and then gifts and entertainment uh, and lobbying as I mentioned. So we're going to first talk about criminal pay to play. In fact, when folks mention pay to play, they don't really think about this aspect of it. And this is, uh, you know, in the old days we used to call this bribery, but now we call it honest service fraud. Um, Aunt Becky just got indicted on honest service fraud uh, this morning, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, for uh, bribing or providing payments to uh, college uh, state college officials. Uh, the reason that st uh, prosecutors have, over the last decade or so, really been using honest service fraud is that they don't really require a lot of proof. They don't require a meeting of the mind. In fact, the Kevin Ring case, which was an Abramoff-related case, kind of set the standard for this, which is, you know, it's pretty much said, look, there can be a quid pro quo and it can be, be implicit. You don't have to actually have a video of someone handing over the envelope and saying, I will vote for your contract if you give me the, give me the money. Um, it can be implicit. So essentially they could take a look at the whole totality of the facts and say, you know, I think that dinner you gave or that charitable contribution gave was really related to this contract you got a month later. Um, you know, and, and, and they kind of can look at that. And it also can be one-sided. So even if the official in his or her mind was not being influenced, the mere fact that you gave something with the thinking that it could influence that person, that is enough. So essentially it becomes a thought crime under this honest service fraud type theory. In fact, to the, the Kevin Ring case that set the standard here was interesting because the lobbyist essentially sent his colleague an email saying, um, you know, this Congressman Doolittle, uh, you know, he, he helped us on a particular matter and now he's looking for redskin tickets. That was enough. That was linkage right there because it showed that he was, you know, the tickets had to do with the fact that uh, he, he, was, uh, he voted on a particular bill. Um, a lot of folks, when in fact I see uh, some, you know, of some other law firms make this mistake too, they say, oh, you know, that Senator Menendez a year ago, he was, there was a hung jury and they, you know, they, uh, the judge, uh, the, the judge, the judge uh, you know, uh, he shut down a couple of, uh, several of the claims 
and therefore we don't have to worry about pay to play anymore. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case. It was a jury trial, first of all, and it was a hung jury. And they really didn't have any evidence. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the doctor or the dentist, he actually gave $160,000 worth of gifts, had a private jet waiting and all, you know, to the Dominican Republic. Menendez then wrote some, you know, got some visas for the doctor's girlfriends. Uh, but they didn't have any evidence. They didn't have any email showing that those were related in any way. And that's why it got off. And in fact, the, the court, when they, it, when they issued that opinion, said, you know, if the, we had enough facts, as in the Terry case, it would have been enough. Now, in the Terry case, it simply involved a lawyer going to a bankruptcy judge and saying, you know, I really look forward to your fundraiser next week, and then they proceeded to talk about the case. And that was enough for an indictment. The lawyer went to jail for uh, uh, 60 months, and the judge went to jail for over 90 months. Th this case actually said that that was still good law. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, this Men the, the Menendez case being dismissed really doesn't help us too much. Um, uh, Corinne Brown is an example of making sure that you, when you give to a charity, it actually exists because the former congresswoman raised about $800,000 with the charitable donations. There was no charity. It turns out she took the money and then started using it on her own travel. So what are the takeaways here? Uh, again, you don't want any evidence showing that there's a connection between anything of value, gifts, entertainment, charitable donations, uh, you know, political contributions, and any particular government decision. Those two things should not be in any one communication or during any one meeting. Uh, by the way, some of these officials, you're there talking to them and they say, you know, uh, I'm, you know, I'm having a midlife crisis. I've been sitting as the CIO here for such a long time. I'm, I'm looking for other jobs. Do you have any ideas? They know, you know, and they, some of them will say, do you have a job? But a lot of them, they kind of hang the bait out there for you, saying, you know, waiting for you to say, you know, I have a great position for you. Those are the things you really want to be careful of when, if, if that's occurring while you're discussing business. Um, you know, timing is another issue uh, where you give this thing a benefit right around the time of the government decision or right afterwards. Uh, it becomes extra dangerous. Uh, and again, knowing who you're giving to. You know, if you're giving to a charity, make sure there's a charity. You know, the tax law requires them to actually hand you a letter if you ask, where the IRS uh, gives them the determination letter uh, granting them C3 status. Um, uh, so you want to make sure you do all that. Now, some of the practical issues, uh, we're G Garrett and Keith are going to uh, get into some of the practical issues uh, in, in implementing uh, compliance with this. Thanks, Keith. So I would say, um, with the understanding that there is actually criminal liability on the table. I mean, we are going to talk a little bit more about some of the sanctions relative to pay to play, but knowing that there is criminal liability on the table and that, um, Key, as you know, it's, it's, it could be more of a thought crime kind of situation. It's not just a suitcase of cash in a dark alley that's being recorded. Um, you're talking about situations that feel almost more normal course and more, more pedestrian. It, it, it breeds the, you know, the need for, for, for sort of extra caution. Uh, uh, in the space. And so first thing, you know, perhaps to think about here is mapping the risk, right? Mapping your firm's particular risk. So where does your firm interact with government officials? And you can think about that both from a firm basis, so the most common example being entering into advisory contracts with state and local plans. Um, you could also think of it from a personnel basis. Do you have employees who are particularly politically active and might actually be engaging a little bit more with uh, public officials uh, than, than, you might, than you might expect. The second is taking that linkage point that Key has, been, Key has been making relative to these honest services cases and thinking, what kinds of compliance controls can I put in place to separate, put distance between the very acceptable normal course kind of behaviors that we're all used to talking about, gifts and entertainment, monitoring political contributions as normal legitimate political speech, and things that might qualify as fraud, as bribery, as violations um, of, these, uh, of these honest services provisions. Um, in terms of the actual compliance controls, we're going to be talking actively about specific compliance controls, so I don't think we need to go, go into that 
um, for purposes of this particular slide, but um, we're also referencing here um, looking out for unusual activity. And I think not only being, you know, thinking about mapping your risk, now I think about putting compliance controls in place to, um, to moderate that risk, but sleep with one eye open, right? Each of our firms are changing all the time, evolving in different ways, both with respect to the workforce. So you've got new hires coming in, you know, all, all the time, but you have different perspectives on political activity. And your business practice may be varying all the time. Okay, you don't have state and local clients today, but your mar sales and marketing team might be actively thinking about the possibility of being active in that space um, six months from now. So always good to be monitoring your firm and your firm's activity and those of your personnel um, going forward. I, I want to add, um, I don't think you can emphasize training enough uh, in this whole space, which is you need to gather information across your firm about what they're doing and be in a position to talk with people about who they're going out and looking uh, for business from. And as a part of the risk assessment that Garrett mentioned, um, going across your firm and doing that, and then as, as a compliance person, you know, I follow the mantra all the time of, of rinse, wash, repeat, right? I mean, you've got to do this, and then you've got to deal with what your findings are by setting up the appropriate compliance controls, and then you've got to repeat, and you've got to do it again. Because one-time training on issues like this, where prevention is paramount, won't be enough. You've, you've got to go back and reinforce it on a regular basis. Uh, be creative. Send out, if you're in a heightened risk situation at all, I mean, if you're above no risk, then you should send out periodic reminders to people. If you've got a compliance newsletter, this is a good topic to put in there. Make sh And you've got to really find a way so that your fir firm is reporting to you or somehow uh, ticking the box somewhere so you can generate a report about the political contacts that are being made. So you can do the back end checks um, that we'll talk about whether it be expense reports and all of the different things that come with it that you need to, to have looked at to make sure you're not missing something. And, and I find it incredibly valuable um, what Key had on the last slide, and, and I want to thank Key for making the slides. He did a great job putting together a lot of information uh, that we're using today. Um, but the point of teaching the people at your firm to not discuss something or a to not discuss fundraising or a thing of value during meetings with public officials, or I guess I might even take that further, just don't discuss them with the public officials at all. That, that seems to be, I think, when I deal with people at firms and, and I think about, I'm really dealing with people here and what do I have to say to them to get my message across? I want my training slide to be jail cell bars and I, and I wanna tell them like, if you have any idea that you think you should curry favor with one of these public officials by insinuating something of value, let's go back to these examples and see that the linkage is so tiny, like just the smallest reference at some point creates that linchpin. And I just think people in their individual capacities fall prey to that so easily. You know, whether it's they wanna get ahead in life they want to prove their self-worth to their spouse. You know, those are the kinds of things that we're really trying to protect against when in the compliance department, we're explaining these rules to people and trying to change their behaviors or, or, and limit their behaviors to appropriate things. So, um, you know, that's what, that's what we really try to reinforce when we're engaged in this rinse, wash, repeat cycle of going through these issues. Once we get the great legal analysis and background that we can apply, then we can get in and, and really um, play to those human emotions and, and know where their motivations come from. People are really motivated to try to slip little things in like that, and he just demonstrated that little things in this area will get you thrown behind bars. Um, on the next slide, I think the chair will contribute. Is anything else you want to cover there? Well, I guess one thought, this last bullet. Uh, remember, it's not just honest service fraud, which is a part of the federal wire fraud provision. It's any rule or law that has a fraud, that has the word fraud in it. So the SEC's fraud provision, California used their corporate fraud provision to go after linkage. 
New York used the Martins Act, which is the securities fraud provision. So literally, different agencies and different ag enforcement agents, it's not just the DOJ that can come after you on this kind of a theory. It, it's any agency that can implement a fraud provision against you. Um, charitable contributions are another source of, um, uh, that fall prey to how people um, find ways to go back around and think that they are disguising things, making legitimate uh, contributions that won't be detected as a, as a way to do an end around um, from actually making a monetary um, uh, contribution. Uh, so there's 2006 NASD guidance on charitable contributions applicable to FINRA members that can be guidance for people. There's a lot of questions um, because for investment advisors in particular because we don't have a specific regulation on point about it. Um, I think it falls more into that category of don't do indirectly um, what you can't do directly, but the, that guidance is a source of, I mean, it's only two pages, but it gives you some indication of the types of written policies and procedures you should consider um, and makes the big distinction about um, employee soliciting contributions rather than the customer soliciting contributions uh, and, and how that is more indicative that you may be uh, in seeing something that's actually an end run, end run to uh, other policies and procedures. Right, because I think they were trying, to, were trying to isolate those things of value, right? Those things that might be of value to the recipient um, that might in fact influence their judgment. So if you're trying to balance a request for a charitable contribution from a plan, sort of at the plan level, versus a request for a charitable contribution that's coming literally from the official. So whether it's a charity that's just near and dear to their hearts, whether it's you know sponsoring a, a table at an event, but for the things, or or if it's even if that official is you know running in a road race and wants you to you know throw throw them a little money you know in in connection with um, in connection with money they're raising for a, a favorite charity. Those types of um, contributions to the official we would think of as being more problematic and keep to your point in the guidance or suggested is, is something to, um, to, to treat with a, with a more focused eye. There's some controls uh, suggested here. Um, one particular about monitoring firm expenses that I would put in the category of raising that area where we have resource constraints as compliance people, right? And you know, for this area alone, monitoring firm expenses becomes another challenge. I've got to do a couple different things if I have risk in this area. I can either decide that I'm going to go through all of the expense reports myself. I can set up a system with finance where they will send me reports on any charitable contributions. Or I can train the finance people to know what to look for to send me information if they see something that's outside the scope. And that depends very much on what your resources are, what, how, how your firm's culture has embedded compliance in all of the employees in that firm, sort of deputizing them and, and making decisions around, around those factors as far as how you best uh, think you can address the risk. Yeah. And we often see in the context of, um, of charitable contributions, and we've, we've noted here um, that, that the creation of separate policies is a bit of an, uh, an, an, evolving, an evolving practice but that we would think of from a best practices perspective, um, pre-clearance, um, and, and likely it's gonna be both from compliance and from senior management. We're talking about writing a check from the firm's checkbook, so you're likely to have a senior manager involved there. Um, and then where possible, going where Keith is going there in terms of a monitoring, a trust but verify kind of mechanism, where you're either working with accounting, um, as Keith noted, to track, those checks as they're being written, uh, make sure that you're capturing everything that, that um, you expect has been reported to you, and perhaps also being in touch with sales and marketing colleagues who are likely the closest to those, um, to those plan uh, state, and local government, um, state and local government clients. Last point I would make is relative to, um, Key mentioned the US v. Brown case. Although there's not law strictly on point here, we're working with guidance, some of it a little older, the fact of that case being recent, which not so much about honest services as it is, be careful who you, um, 
contribute to uh, if, if requested by, a, by an official. These things can be messy and then get really messy really fast. Given that type of case, when you get that kind of a case, it's, it's naturally the kind of thing that's going to get more and more attention. So it's a good developing area for folks to keep an eye on. You know, I've also seen some clients kind of take a substantive approach to this because, you know, I think one, one general approach is look at each charitable donation, you know, based on some set policy on, and standards on and avoiding linkage and the like. The other approach I've seen is clients saying, you know, Key, we just don't want to deal with this. So we're going to set up a substantive uh, substantive guidance at the very beginning. We're only going to give to these kinds of charities. We're only going to give under these circumstances and charities that support these issues. And so when a, an official comes knocking on your door uh, asking for a charitable donation, you can simply just wave the policy and say, sorry, this is all we can do. And so um, that's another way to kind of short circuit uh, the, the, the approach as well. So a little bit uh, to, the, to the heart of the SEC rule that we have that says that it'll be unlawful for an investment advisor to make payments to decision makers of accredited financial institutions and send their kids to such schools for four years. <laughs> Isn't that what it says up there? Oh, sorry. I couldn't resist. I had, had to bring it up. I mean, it was just too obvious, right? Um, so Rule 20645, adopted a few years ago. Um, basically um, put in place for, at the SEC for registered investment advisors uh, a rule that prohibits an advisor uh, managing a state or local government entity's funds from receiving compensation for two years if the advisor, a PAC that it controls, or one of its con covered associates contributes to an official of that government entity. Um, so in adopting this, I think there were First Amendment considerations to try to adopt a rule at, with his, uh, with his, that met the requirements of um, protecting the fiduciary duty and that goes between the parties in this case without actually limiting the ability to make uh, political contributions. So we have de minimis that are in the rule of you can give $150 to somebody that you're not voting for or $350 to somebody that you do have the capacity to vote for. Um, these de minimis restrictions designed to mean that you still can exercise your free speech. The fact that it's a timeout from receiving fees is another way that I think the rule has survived because it doesn't absolutely restrict political contributions. It's tempered to protect that constitutional right. Um, but as we look at this, don't make judgments about your pay-to-play policy before we get to slides 18 and 19 with state and local rules because a lot of people, I think, make that mistake. They see the SEC rule. They go, this is what we have to uh, abide by. Uh, we can handle these de minimises and we'll be fine. Well, there's state and local laws we're going to look at he's going to tell us about that don't have those de minimis uh, requirements. So um, you also have to look out for when you hire new covered associates. Make sure that you are checking with those covered associates about the political contributions that they've made because the two-year look back will apply for those covered associates who will solicit on your behalf. Um, a six-month look back applies to other covered associates who don't solicit. The definition of covered associate is such that it's executive persons and I'm not often at too many companies where executive persons should not be soliciting when the time is right so you want to be careful about making too much out of that distinction I think um, there are additional bans on soliciting and coordinating contributions um, for state and local party committees um, and again we've, we've mentioned this indirect violations are prohibited um, which is trying to get around these rules by making donations to uh, party committees and PACs. All should remain subject to close supervision. It's often one of the toughest things for compliance officers to explain to executives that you want to make a donation to this PAC. I can't pre-clear it until I can do some review of the PAC and what the PAC's purpose is set up for. And if it's a pass-through for an elected official, then the same rules will apply 
about not being able to make more than de minimis contributions. And so you often find compliance officers digging through documentation about PACs to try to figure out what it is um, the PAC is structured to do, sometimes coming up with vague information that really frets, frustrates the executive because the compliance officer doesn't quite know how to apply it at that point. And I'm sure that's when they turn it back to you, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> the more the merrier, I think. Uh, <laughs> in fact, for lawyers, this is the this is like a dream in this area because it is so vague. Uh, and you know that's it's true because of compliance. I mean, this is the thing. If we if we evaluate, do the risk assessments, and come up with high risk in this area, there's no doubt we're like then you, we need to turn back to the lawyers to make sure that the rules are correctly in place so the compliance then can monitor them correctly. And you know, it, it, as I mentioned, it, it's a perfect marriage for lawyers because you take all of the kind of the strict liability and bright line standards that the SEC imposes under this pay to play rule and the kind of the automatic ban. And then you wed it with the purely logical political system we have and the committees that they've set up, which brings us to our next slide. Uh, that's a very long segue, by the way. So uh, what, when you're give, making political contributions, it's easy when you're giving to candidates, right? You give to a governor, it's covered. You give to a governor running for federal office, it's covered, which by the way, there, there's a couple already in the mix for the Democratic uh, nomination. Um, the, but when you start giving to political committees, things start getting a little strange. Uh, you have federal PACs out there, you have national party committees, which are generally okay, by the way, like the RNC, DNC as long as you know you keep a record that it wasn't solicited by a, go a covered official. Uh, you have federal PACs, as I mentioned, where you get some letter from them that uh, is becoming like an industry standard now uh, from these federal PACs that they don't get to state candidates. And usually general uh, state and local party committees and PACs are usually a good idea to stay away from them. But then you get things like joint fundraising committees. And what a joint fundraising committee is, it's a combination of those. Like for example, at the federal level, they're called JFCs and they're, depending on which ones they are, they're, they're composed of a combination of every type of committee I just mentioned. It can be a, a candidate committee combined with a national party committee, with a federal leadership pack, and also state and local party committees. Now, as Keith mentioned, you're banned from soliciting for a state and local party committee, right? And so your senior executive comes up to you and says, you know, I want to raise money for the uh, the, the Trump Victory Fund, or you know the Hillary Victory Fund, which were all joint fundraising committees. Now, if you raise money for a Hillary Victory Fund and you are a covered associate, it actually violates the pay to play rule because that Victory Fund had about 20 different state parties built into it. Uh, and so, you know, some of the camp presidential campaigns have set up separate Victory Funds just for people subject to the pay to play rule such as yours. So you really need to kind of get into the weeds of what these victory funds are, not just raising money for them, but also contributing to them. So you want to make sure that when your executive comes to you with one of these uh, joint, uh, joint fundraising committees, you look at all the underlying participants and direct the money only to those entities that you are allowed to give to. Um, they're, the, you know, political, uh, campaigns have gotten even more creative and they've come up with these things called uh, the nom nominee funds. And these on their face look very benign. It simply says, look, give us money to this campaign and it will, re it, this campaign will essentially function as the campaign for whoever becomes the Democratic nominee for the U.S. Senate in this state. So you don't even know who the candidate is until the, no until the nomination occurs. Uh, uh, and so if a governor, you know, if the governor running for president happens to be the one that's nominated, your money now has knocked you out of that state. Like, for example, you know, uh, I think uh, Jay uh, Isley from the governor of Washington is running already, and um, and the mayor of uh, the mayor of South Bend in Indiana has already thrown his hat in the ring as well. So. Giving to these nominee funds are very dangerous because you really don't know who the nominee is going to be until the convention, right? So uh, you want to be very uh, careful of those. And again, state officials running for federal office, every presidential cycle, I always have clients who trigger a ban unwittingly. You know, um, even going back to uh, Sarah Palin and George W. Bush, when George W. Bush ran in 2000, 
it, it, we didn't have a pay to play role for investment advisors yet. But for the broker dealer clients, several people were knocked out of Texas because he was still the governor of Texas and he was running for president. Last cycle, the big target was uh, John Kasich. Uh, in fact, we have several waivers that the SEC has granted involving Kasich's presidential uh, race. Um, so, uh, again, you want to be very careful. And, and by the way, as far as your programming, your, your compliance program goes, you want to make sure you pre-clear everything. You know, I see some compliance programs where they say, okay, you only need to pre-clear state officials running for a federal office. You don't need to pre-clear all the other federal candidates. Most of your folks have no idea if it's a state official running for, you know, they'll say, you know, for, for example, Hickenlooper right now, uh, you know, who's in the race, he, he, was, a, he was governor until t 2018, so he's not actually covered. But someone who's in office right now still is. And Mike Pence was covered, believe it or not, and he, he was, uh, he, was uh, he's, he remained the governor of Indiana up, almost up until the uh, inaugural. And so everyone who was giving, including to the inaugural committees, were triggering bans in the state of Indiana because he was the vice president. When you gave to that, you were giving to the combined ticket of Trump and Mike Pence. So again, the, this federal candidate is a very dangerous area. Um, you, you won't be alone. When I've told an executive within five miles of here that giving to one of these committees where you don't know the candidate yet could, be a vi could turn into a violation, his head just exploded. I mean, this is definitely the things you, you've got to have this legal analysis. It, it's still hard to convince we're, them. We're saving keep. questions it's still for hard the end. To convince so, them. Sorry, because we have so much to go through. Yeah. Garrett, you want to? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, picking up key where you left off, uh, off year contributions to uh, the national political parties. So, as you already mentioned, you know, typically contributions to national political parties, not state and local, but national political parties are okay. These are entities which are in the norm, not funding uh, directly state and local campaigns and are uh, providing uh, funding and support across a variety of different federal campaigns. But in an off year, so we're talking about a year when there are no active federal campaigns, but there may be a handful of very noisy state governor's races, uh, you, may, you, you start to wonder, well, what are you doing with that money? And in fact, uh, in the past, those parties have actually used those state campaigns uh, in order to raise funds uh, for the national party. So from a compliance perspective, um, we're still in that spot. We're trying to prove that these are not indirect contributions to a state or local, uh, state or local government official. So it calls on you to you know, do your diligence, make sure that that support is, is in fact not going to a state and local candidate. If you can, get it in writing from the party uh, you're going to want to confirm with your colleague that they have not been solicited by a state or local official to contribute to the national race. So there's been some uh, history of that, some very interesting guidance relative to, um, relative to a, I believe, a speech from then Governor Pataki right. uh, to, uh, to a group of financial services professionals. Um, and if you can't get that comfort, if you can't get that guidance, you may be positioned to have to, um, to reject the contribution. And I would note, if you're looking for some late night reading, some very interesting late night reading. You pull out the FAQs uh, from the MSRB on rule G37. That's not binding on SEC advisors, but it is, the SEC even points out that it is you know, informative guidance, if not binding. And there's a lot of information in there uh, on that indirect contribution line. So not a contribution to directly to a campaign, but a contribution to a blank political party, PAC, et cetera, that's, that's actually quite helpful. Last sort of pitfall that we pointed out is not in this direct or indirect space. It's actually, it's actually baked into the rule. And this is a rule, frankly, that, though it is a little painful to go through sometimes, really deserves a close read, because uh, you will pick up on things that, um, that are not, you know, not, not, a, not intuitive relative to the administration of the rule. But this is one. So a colleague comes to you and says, hey, want to give to an inaugural transition committee, uh, right, this, the campaign is done, the person won, there should be no issue here, I'm not helping them with anything, I'm just, just helping them celebrate their victory. Do you clear it or you don't clear it? You don't clear it. You don't clear it because in, this, in the rule itself, the definition of contribution, so you gotta go all the way to the back, but definition of contribution includes specifically inaugural and transition committees monies. 
So it would be found to be, even though it was after a campaign had concluded, even though it wasn't you know, support that got that person elected, it's still considered a contribution and will still, uh, still unfortunately, put the fee ban in place. So one of those little bits um, to, be, to be concerned about, um, give, that, give that rule a close read. By the way, this even includes just buying a ball ticket, right? You, know, you want to go and eat like pigs in a blanket all night and be, uh, you know, uh, you know, suffocated all night. You buy that ten dollar or you know fifteen dollar uh, ball ticket, and that's that's an inaugural contribution right there. Key's going to a minor league game, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are a number of campaign contribution enforcement actions that have come out. Um, we won't go through them in any great detail for uh, time's sake, um, but it's, a, it's an area where what these cases make clear is that this is not a squishy kind of enforcement area really in any way, which is that if the contributions have been there and an advisor has received fees, um, it really doesn't seem to matter that once that's discovered, the firm is likely gonna be uh, subject to enforcement um, we can talk about the fines here in just a second, which is a popular topic, but uh, I want to mention that the most recent uh, enforcement action, Ancora Advisors, December 18th, 2018, um, specifically had a statement that after the contributions in that case were made to the governor and treasurer of Ohio, that the covered associates requested that the contributions be returned. So they tried to get them back, but they had made the contributions and the firm had collected fees um, past the time that they discovered that the contributions had actually been made and therefore they were subject to an enforcement action. So uh, the, the other area that I just mentioned comes up with these cases is a discussion of the penalties and the seeming notion that some of these penalties are actually less than what the uh, advisor received in fees um, based on continuing to provide services to the advisory client that was related to it. Um, and I think the prevailing notion uh, that we had when we did a pre-conference call was the fact that the penalty here, the monetary penalty, is really just the beginning of uh, what's gonna happen to the firm. We all know that if you're dealing with state and government clients, you're probably dealing often with RFPs and filling out information, including your disciplinary information so the bigger thing to enforce to your um, leadership at your firm is the likelihood of losing RFPs, uh, suffering in due diligence uh, questionnaires and uh, processes, and losing business otherwise, other than the advisory client that you attracted by making these political contributions that violate the rule. About the, so these cases really send you conflicting messages, right? The first message, I get one of two types of calls. Um, clients call me and go, oh, this is getting serious. They're starting to go after firms left and right. And by the way, there were some more cases even after this, right? Um, the other call I get is, as Keith mentioned, wait a minute here. I'm looking at, I'm just guesstimating, looking at the amount of the assets under management, uh, for 1%, $7 million in fees, and they get, what, a $100,000 fine. So why are we caring about those rules too much, right? That's the other kind of, you know, sentiment I get. I, I think the real question is, does this change anything that we do? Do we put less resources into it as an advisor? Do we care about it less? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. Because, the, you know, if you look at these penalties, again, they're not, the, the, they weren't disgorgement penalties as they were, that, as they have been in the past. Um, but at the end of the day, you ask yourself, okay, once I have, know about the contribution, what am I gonna do as an advisor? Am I gonna tell my business, go ahead, because you can get you know, $8 million in fees and let's just pay a $100,000 penalty if we get caught? Or do we go in for a waiver? You know, or do we call Holly? And uh, the answer has to be the second one, right? Because if you look at these settlements, none of them were like knowing and willful violations. You know, none of them were scenarios where the company said, okay, I have a ban on my hands and I'm gonna go ahead and do business anyway. I don't think these penalties are reflective, re reflective of that kind of a violation. These were, you know, 
simple, we screwed up violations and, and, and it came up that way. So I really don't think it changes uh, as an advisor what you do uh, at the end of the day and, and, and how much you monitor uh, the, these, these activities. Which brings us to the waiver. What, what happens when <laughs> well, you yes. give Holly a call? Uh, well, before I begin my remarks, just to let you know, of course, these are my views and the, not the views of the commission or other commissioners or uh, members of the staff. Um, I guess before we turn to um, executive orders, just, a, just a, quick, uh, a quick couple of thoughts on the enforcement um, slide that we just covered. So the Public Finance Abuse Unit um, is a specialized unit within enforcement, and they handle pay-to-play cases. And they remain very active and very interested in this area. Um, I think um, having recently brought the, the um, ANCORA action, um, I think it's also noteworthy that um, many actions have involved exempt reporting advisors, and so that's just something to keep in mind that the rule does apply to exempt reporting advisors. So, firms, if firms without really well developed compliance programs. <laughs> yes, well, I'm, not yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so, in any case, um, so if you find yourself in a situation where perhaps you have, um, you've discovered a, a, a contribution that exceeds the de minimis, um, you, you may consider seeking an exemptive order. And when the rule was adopted um, in 2010, the commission recognized there could be circumstances that would warrant an, an advisor receiving an exemption. And the rule specifically provided the commission with that ability to provide limited exem exemptions and limited circumstances to advisors to receive compensation notwithstanding the ban. And I think this reflected a recognition that there may be some situations where imposing the ban is just not in the public interest. Um, so the commission er issued the first order in 2013 and gave the staff delegated authority to issue um, orders thereafter. And since that time, we've issued 13 orders. And just backtracking to a couple of slides ago, I would say that four of those orders that we've issued have all involved state officials um, that ran for federal office. And in particular, three of those, um, those orders related to John Kasich. So again, something to remind your teams about to uh, make sure that they understand that. Um, so I would broadly characterize um, the orders that we granted, the, the facts and circumstances um, underlying those orders, as really examples in which someone made a mistake, they identified that mistake, they promptly corrected it, and they made improvements to policies and procedures, and there were no factors that suggested pay to play. And I'll touch on the factors in, in just a few moments. But first, I'll, I'll spend a couple of moments talking about the application process, because it may not be something that you deal with on a database basis, and maybe you'll never have to deal with. Um, but uh, so we, the Division of Investment Management, we process um, uh, the pay-to-play applications. And applications are, uh, they outline the facts, the legal analysis, and arguments for relief. And uh, if you take away nothing else from what I'm about to say, I, please take away this, that is, if you find yourself thinking, oh, you know, I should consider filing an application, please talk to the staff first. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you about the facts, um, the analysis, to give you a read on whether it would be something that we would support so you don't end up just, you know, kind of uh, wasting some time and some money. Uh, another thing that's a little bit unusual about these order or these applications um, as c uh, um, compared to investment company applications, for example, are these are filed uh, anachronistically in paper. So if you just send in a paper application, you know, there is a question about whether it would reach the right person, unfortunately. So, um, another important thing to um, keep in mind is that all of our applications, notices, and orders are all available on our website. And they really give you an, an idea of um, the situations that we've, for which we've issued relief in the past. And our applications are very, are precedented. So each one builds on the one before it and so on. Uh, so, and I, Sometimes we'll get um, applications that are, I guess I would characterize as kind of creative writing exercises, um, and that is really a waste of time and money. Um, uh, we will tell you if you receive an application that's more of a creative write writing exercise to go back, redraft, follow the applications that have been noticed and ordered. Um, th th that process helps us to be much more efficient, it puts everybody on the same kind of playing field, and, uh, and it's, uh, it, it's a much more, um, just a, a better process. So our applications, uh, notices, and orders are all available on our website and um, through our uh, division's homepage. So in terms of process, um, after you've called the staff, of course, and you, and, uh, you file an application, 
will then process the application and, and give you comments. Um, the time it takes to kind of get from the start to the end depends on, on many factors. It depends on our workload. It depends on the time it takes for you to, um, to get back to us in response to comments and, and other things. I mean, we, we certainly recognize that um, you know, you're, the advisor is not receiving compensation during this time, so we try to process applications as expeditiously as possible. Uh, once we um, are finished with comments, we'll issue a notice, which is published in the Federal Register. There's a notice period of about 25 days and allows interested persons to um, make a hearing request. Uh, we haven't had any hearing requests for, in the pay-to-play context, um, but uh, that, that option's open. And then we'll issue, um, assuming everything goes okay, um, we'll issue an order, which is also published in the Federal Register. So now I'll take a, a couple of moments and talk about the factors that we consider um, in reviewing applications. And these are outlined in the rule, and I, I tend to think they're pretty common sense and provide a nice framework around um, what can be a subjective test. So the first one is a public interest finding. So in other words, you know, that I issuing the exemptive order is appropriate with respect to the purposes of rule and the protection of investors. And this is a finding we have to make in many, many um, other types of um, applications requesting relief from a particular provision. The second is whether the investment advisor has adopted reasonably designed policies and procedures to prevent violations of the pay to play rule. And here, the staff will ask you, you know, what improvements could be made to ensure that violations um, would not happen in the future. You know, it, this is something some, we occasionally get some kickback uh, against, you know, but clearly the violation happened, so you really take, take some time and think about whether there could be some improvements to policies and procedures. The third factor is whether prior or at the time the contribution that resulted in the violation of the pay-to-play rule, the, whether the advisor had actual knowledge of the contribution. This isn't a factor that comes up too frequently in our review, but um, you know, there's a question of whether, uh, the, um, whether the covered associate could be so senior that um, it could be imputed to the advisor. I mean, the clear, obvious example that would never come up probably in an application is just a sole proprietor. Um, the next factor is whether is the advisor, after learning of the contribution, has taken all available steps to cause the contribution to be returned and taken such other remedial or other preventative measures as may be appropriate under the circumstances. And so here we'll ask, you know, what were the circumstances surrounding the contribution? When was the contribution made? Um, when was it discovered and how? And how's a refund being requested and obtained? The next factor is whether the contributor was a covered associate, otherwise an employee of the advisor, or was seeking employment. And here, just a, a practice note to be, uh, to read the definition of covered associate very closely. Um, it can be a bit complicated and, and uh, we will ask you uh, to confirm that. And uh, in particular too, if you have a covered associate that is a solicitor, for us that entails kind of a heightened level of review clearly because of the potential for play to play. Um, the next factor is the timing and amount of the contribution. And here we'll be thinking about things like, you know, is there a connection, a, a nexus to new business? Um, I'd also point out it's not necessarily the dollar amount of the contribution um, because you could have the same dollar amount of, of a contribution, but it might have much more impact, for example, in a small local election than in perhaps um, a federal election in the case where a, a state official is running for office. Um, and then finally, the contributor's apparent intent or motive in making the contribution which resulted in the ban as evidenced by the facts and circumstances surrounding such contribution. And this, I would say, is just, I'd like to think of it as kind of a wrap up of all of the, all of the factors I just talked about as well as kind of bookending nicely with the first one, um, whether the uh, granting the request is in the public interest. And I'd also add that um, we also will ask and will consider uh, factors such as, you know, the contributor's historical uh, or a pattern of, of uh, contributions. This is someone that was politically active, and so this, this contribution is just representative of a pattern of contributions and not you know, a specific one trying to, um, trying to obtain business. And uh, the next um, item I'm gonna talk about is acknowledging the ban. We will ask in the, in the application for the advisor to represent that it's informed its government clients that, um, that, are, effect that um, are affected that it violated the pay to play rule and that its, its fees will be placed in escrow. Um, 
just a word about escrow, there's no requirement to place fees in escrow, but we've found, I think, over time that that seems to be the easiest thing for people to do. There may be other ways to achieve that, um, and again, call the staff if you have questions, um, but uh, thus far, um, escrow seems to be the, the most practical way. Um, future business and prospective waivers. This can be a little contentious, but in general, our position is that we do not review applications that are not ripe. So, for example, if an advisor does not have any business with the um, would, would have been affected government client, to us it's not really right for, for um, review at that point. Um, having said that, um, it's very facts and circumstances based. So if you find yourself in a situation where you, know, you don't actually have a particular government client that you know, would have been affected by the contribution, you know, please, please uh, give us a call. And um, finally, I think I talked about timing um, in terms of, of uh, how long it takes to process applications. So, thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Holly. Um, we are running out of time really quickly, so I do want to kind of jump to the practical slide here. Um, by the way, there have been some recent lawsuits. They've all been thrown out on standing, um, you know, not, uh, they never really gotten to the merits of the constitutionality of the rule. So there are state and local pay-to-play laws which kind of mimicked these pay to, uh, the SEC rule and the rule G37. Um, the the, the old, oldest one out there is 2005, so they're pretty uh, recent. Here are all of the states and localities that have uh, these pay-to-play laws. Uh, some states, by the way, have reporting requirements either in addition to or in lieu of a ban. So uh, these are the jurisdictions that have those reporting. There are some significant differences between the state and local, the state laws and the federal pay-to-play rule. Uh, the first has to do with who's covered. You know, you're used to looking at employees who are uh, covered associates. Well, the state laws also get at outside board members. They get at their spouses and dependent children. Uh, and then they also cover affiliates. So if, let's say, you have a, you're, you're an advisor affiliated with a bank holding company, the the contribution by the holding company and the PAC and all other sister companies will knock you out of business under a good number of these laws. Uh, they also get at covered recipients, the differences, uh, you know, how SC, the SEC rule covers only those officials who can influence or appoint people to the, to the, who can influence the selection of an advisor. A lot of these state laws just covers everyone. And they also, a lot of them co directly cover contributions to like state party committees and PACs. It's not an indirect issue anymore, as Keith was mentioning. Uh, and some states go beyond political contributions. They go to gifts and entertainment, like CalSTRS. If you go over their, uh, five, what is now a $500 per year gift limit, they will refuse to do business with you for two years automatically. Um, and again, the consequences may be different. Uh, a lot of these state laws create a ban on not just compensation, it just knocks you out of business altogether. They can void the contract. Some of them are forced to void the contract if you made a contribution in the middle of it. And, uh, and in other jurisdictions, they can go after you criminally. Like in Connecticut, they could actually go after the contributor, the officer who made the contribution, in addition to knocking you out of the contract. Right. So the most important question, what do we do about this? Right, so if you're thinking about these issues from a compliance perspective, again, you go back to that first point on risk mapping. If you have no state and local government clients and have no intention of having any state and local government clients, well, lucky you. You're not worried about this stuff. You and should not be in this room right now. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, but if you do, then, of course, you're thinking of controls. And in the, in the pay-to-play area with respect to state pay-to-play provisions, you have a choice. You know, are you going to proactively go about updating your policy, enhancing your already federal pay-to-play policy because this is a high, high risk, high business area for you, you might. Um, or you might do it selectively. You might, you might treat state issues sort of as they come. When we think about hallmarks of a good compliance program sort of across, you know, without going through all of the different elements, we've talked about pre-clearance, um, we've talked about training, we've talked about um, testing, one area that I thought would be interesting to, to talk about a little bit is, is that monitoring and testing point. So this is the sort of a trust but verify kind of issue. So you have people coming to you to pre-clear, but how do you know that you're picking all of those things up? How do you know that you're picking up all the activity? So a practice has developed around affirming using independent resources um, that you're actually getting all, um, 
all of the different contributions that are, that are going in. And it was a question that I, I wanted to, if we'd have a, a, a engage Holly with you a little bit about, um, does the SEC, you know, when you think about um, where people should look, the resources they should be using, whether sampling a part of their employee population as opposed to, you know, all, maybe all of their covered associates all the time, um, you think about the frequency that people should be doing these kinds of reviews with, is, is that something that the staff has sort of actively thought about or given guidance on? Well, we haven't given guidance specifically about that, but I will say OC has been, um, has examined advisors um, about this. Um, in fact, recent, I think in 2016-17, they, they examined about 50 advisors to public pension plans. And among other things, they found, you know, a lack of internal controls. Mm. So, there, and, and also a lack of uh, policy procedures in general. Um, but certainly one of the things that, that OC found um, was that uh, advisors were not availing, availing themselves of information available in free, you know, political contribution um, databases, for example. And, and certainly I like to think of, well, one way to think about this is, is if, you know, enforcement can find it easily, then, you know, it might be something to think about. Right, right. So no, you know, no, no firm guidance and no legal requirement to do it, but certainly a developing best practice. And I'll note, this is not an advertisement, but uh, if you're circulating around the booth, this is the first time where some of that collateral in your bag, ha we have specifically have providers that are focused on uh, electronic solutions, data feed solutions for play to play, which is, I think, something we can expect to see, you know, really, really develop over the, the next couple of years, because the main complaint is how in the hell do I, okay, sure, I, maybe I can go to a federal, like an FC, FEC website or Open Secrets, but how do I get all these state and local contribution information all in one place, updated with clean data? It's hard. It's resource intense and it's hard. So it is something that people are trying to actively think about um, solutions uh, versus the, the resources and the risk that it bears for their firm. Um, I would just otherwise note, um, and Keith is something that you, you, had, uh, you had really focused on here, training, particularly training ahead of election cycles is a, a great best practice. Um, and if you can, put a canary in the coal mine. In other words, if your, firm, um, if your firm is either interested or has a developing prospect list for state and local clients, be in touch with your sales and marketing team, right? Meet with them regularly, or if you have visibility to a prospect list, keep an eye on it because it's always helpful in these situations to able to know when a prospect is coming so you have the opportunity to do the research ahead of time, whether from a pay to play perspective, a gifts and entertainment perspective, or a lobbying perspective, knowing that that prospect is coming and being able to get ahead of it will give you a huge leg up in keeping your firm in a good compliant position. Which kind of brings us toward the end here. So um, do we have any questions before we break? I know there were a couple of the round. Yes. Uh, the question is, is there a website where you can uh, track charitable donations? And the answer is no. Uh, because the charities are not allowed, well, the, the IRS is not allowed to publicly disclose the charitable donors. Uh, the charities disclose donors who give 5000 to the IRS, but the IRS is then supposed to redact that before they make their tax returns public. So uh, there is no place for that. Yeah. It's a great question, though. When you think about the monitoring on the back end, um, that is why when we, we, we were talking earlier, it, it may help to create that connectivity with the finance department, because you're talking about a check being written by the firm. Well, now, it's two levels, right? It's not a firm level, but more it's written by the employee So interestingly, I think what we focused on here um, is our contributions made, charitable contributions, sorry, made at the firm level. You've raised a great point, though, and, and certainly the idea of, of an employee separately making a charitable contribution is also an issue, and that, to the point that Key has just made and to the point we just made is very difficult to track. And so you're going to end up relying more on your training certification. and certifications right. than anything else. That's exactly right. The good news is it's harder, it's as hard for the government to track too. So that's a good <laughs> <laughs> There was another question over there, right? Or are you good? I have a cheeky question. Um, would, any, would you think any waivers would have been granted in the cases of the enforcement actions where they were applied? So had they gone through the process and said, this stuff might come particularly ones where you know, it was pretty obvious from the enforcement order. I don't think that's a question that I can answer, but it's a good one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the question is, uh, are there other states where there are lobby registration rules like California? And the answer is yes. 
there are right now 29 states where trying to get business from pension funds or government agencies is covered. Um, uh, where I think the investment advisor industry is settling right now is they are dealing with around 10 states, a good number of cities and counties as well, that are the higher risk areas where you're seeing the certifications, uh, RFP certs, uh, like you know in, uh, in Texas, for example, and, and in LA. Um, they're dealing with the higher risk. There's around 10 states which are higher risk for the investment advisor uh, uh, industry. Uh, the other states, what we're seeing is kind of a hesitancy, because kind of the law says the same thing and it's covered, but we're seeing a hesitancy in the advisor industry to actually register because they don't want to be the first one to do it. And so, you know, you see states like Florida, you see various states where you're not seeing a lot of RIAs register, uh, but there are around 10 states where it is scrutiny and otherwise a higher uh, risk jurisdictions. Uh, we actually have that. If, uh, if we could, yeah. <laughs> And keys note that it's states and municipalities is also critical. So if, if you're uh, reviewing some of the um, uh, some of the guidance on the point or some of the, the popular articles, you'll you'll see you know New York City, you know, California followed by New York City followed by you know cities in Pittsburgh where uh, Pennsylvania, sorry, um, where this this issue comes up. So unfortunately, you have to you have to even be more broad about the way that you're thinking about it, not just state but also um, municipal entities as well which I think brings us to the end of our time here. Um, what we did not cover are outside consultants, gifts, and lobbying. And we intentionally kind of put more in the slides than we knew we would go through. So if you have any questions on that, we could take it offline. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much. Thanks.